You've landed on The Substance, a podcast aimed at being biblical, thoughtful, and human. Join us here every other week as we engage the culture without the culture war. I'm your host, Philip Marinello, saying it's uh, <laughs> it's been a heck of a week for me, a heck of a week or two. Um, props to editor Dave and to my guest and to so many people this week. Um, I don't want to turn this intro into just Philip's problems, but it's been a wild week uh, for me. One of the nice things, uh, though, as uh, some of the listeners who follow us on social media may have seen, uh, Trevor, former co-host and my original partner here at The Substance, um, he and his family came uh, up from Texas to Kansas City to spend some time, got to meet his new little baby boy and catch up with him, spend a few days with their family. That was really nice. And then uh, had a uh, hundreds of gallons of water in my house and it's drying out really loudly. So recording this intro here from my garage because the Wi-Fi reaches out here and it's quiet. So uh, getting back on track here. Um, So if you're new to the substance, uh, it's not about all the issues (laughs) going on here. We are a weekly uh, Christian variety show where we look at a number of topics related to faith, culture, the arts, and we like to have on smart, interesting, talented people join us for interesting conversation. Previous guests include folks like Karen Swallow Pryor, artist Stephanie Stalvey, John Harris from the Bodies Behind the Bus podcast, recording artist Propaganda, and Josh Larson from the Film Spotting podcast. And I want to give credit here to where credit is due. Every now and then on our social media, I will solicit feedback from the audience, say, hey, what sorts of topics do you want to cover? What sort of books? What sorts of films? What sorts of guests? And um, I think quite a while ago, uh, one of the times where we initially made contact with our guest here today, um, it was due to uh, Lauren Mulford, one of our listeners in Michigan. So shout out to Lauren. Thanks for tagging Josh. He responded, hey, I'd love to talk to you. And it's been a while kind of getting things together. You're going to hear about that in the show. We talk about some of the uh, health issues and some of the journey Josh and his family has been on with that. Um, in the episode, but so all that to say, thank you, Lauren. This is a uh, a wonderful conversation I had with uh, Josh Nadeau. So many of you uh, know our guest here today, who runs the Sword and Pencil Instagram account, where he illustrates and writes uh, a lot of things, um, particularly related to uh, faith and theology and practice. Um, like holy living, holy thinking, um, and a lot of great uh, church history stuff. Um, Josh is a big reader. Uh, he, he reads widely, and that's another thing we talk about in the show. Before we get to my conversation with Josh, though, I did want to highlight one of our new uh, podcast reviews we got on Apple Podcasts uh, from listener JJ Concepts. Uh, this appeared to be after our uh, conversation with Josh Larson from Film Spotting and his book, Fear Not. JJ says, As a person of faith, I've been afraid of watching horror movies. I liked you all saying to watch the old classics first to wet your palate. Thank you for this insightful podcast. Great content, great host, great guests. So thank you, uh, JJ. I'll take the thank you for the great hosts. And uh, thank you to Editor Dave for helping us bring out great content. And uh, yeah, we we really do have some great guests. Feel free to uh, email us at thesubstancepod at gmail.com or DM us on Instagram if there are guests who you think, um, whatever they're involved in, whether it's ministry, theology, public justice work, just public good in general, uh, the arts, what have you, um, feel free to put them on our radar like Lauren did with Josh here, and uh, you may see them in the future. As well as if this is a show you like and you haven't written us a review, feel free to go do that as well. It really helps us, uh, helps new people find the show uh, who may appreciate it. So, Without further ado, here is my conversation with Josh. Hey, this is Editor Dave, and as the editor for this show, I have the power to just come on and say whatever I want, whenever I want, and there's nothing Philip can do about it. But I won't abuse that power. I assure you. Just wanted to pop on real quick and let you know that there were some internet issues, and so this recording was done in probably like four different parts, and I spliced them all together, and everything is listenable, but around like the 30 or so minute mark, you will notice a difference in Josh's audio. 
So I just wanted you to be aware of that. I know when I listen to podcasts, when something like that happens, when it's not addressed, it like sticks in my mind and I end up missing it. So I wanted you to be warned so that you could just move past it and continue to listen to this awesome conversation. So here are Philip and Josh. Josh Nadeau, welcome to... <laughs> Dave, you can keep this in or water. Cut it again. I'll give you another one. But I literally almost said, Josh Nadeau, welcome to Sword and Pencil. You got me all... Boom. Uh... <laughs> takeover. Hostile takeover. <laughs> welcome to The Substance. Yeah, it's my absolute pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. It is, uh, it is a pleasure to have you. Uh, listeners who, who have been following along online may have noticed I, I try almost never to solicit feedback or promote stuff that is not in the can because we are a, a small operation uh, with finite resources. So I've got a lot of people on the calendar. I'm in talks with a lot of um, both well-known and obscure people who I think have good things to say to be on the show in the future. And I almost never talk about it until it's either like set hard in the books for the next couple of days or it's already recorded in the can. Uh, a couple months ago, I definitely posted. I was like, hey, guys, going to have Josh on from Sword and Pencil. You got any questions? And then and then some serious, uh, serious stuff happened. You want to kind of give us a, a health yeah. update? Yeah. So um, we had some good stuff in the books, which was, I was super pumped for. And then um, for your listeners who don't know, July 2022, I was rushed into the hospital, had some, I'll make a really long story short. I was coughing up a bunch of blood. That first time I lost like two liters and they didn't know what was going on. Yeah, it was wild. They didn't know what was going on. Two liters. Americans don't know liters, but we got those two liter bottles. That's how much blood you lost. Yeah, you guys have the, yeah, that's how much blood I lost. It It was a nightmare. Um, And... Since then, it's just been, I've been in and out of the hospital. We calculated that in the year from July to July, I probably spent a total of two months in the hospital, all for the same stuff. And so we were planning on doing this in June. I had a couple episodes, but um, actually, this is like really good news for today is Thursday. So today is 89 days since my last bleed, which is huge. That's amazing. Um, the only reason I know that is because tomorrow's 90 days. And once you hit that 90 day threshold, feels like all systems are go. So uh, it's been a That's wild exciting. journey. Uh, yeah, we're feeling pretty good that it's by God's grace, Lord willing, hopefully mostly, if not entirely behind us. Well, I, I hope so. And not not to be trite about it, but I, I would love to hear whatever you're comfortable sharing. Like what have... And I know you have a, a relatively uh, new son on the way, and I know health complications yeah. are always scary. But what have what have you and your family been comforted by? What have you been surprised yeah. by? I mean, like those times, suffering is one of those harsh revealers of who you really are and what you really care about and what you're really about. Um, most people I know myself tend to think that they've got everything locked and loaded in case something like that happens. And maybe some people do, but you never know. C.S. Lewis talks about how you can have faith in a rope uh, to tie it around a box for a present as much as you want. But when you have to hang off the edge of a cliff with that same rope, a question of faith becomes a lot more poignant. And so um, for us, it was a year of like that situation just completely shattered whatever facade of control we had of our lives. And when it first happened, Aizen was three months pregnant. Uh, She gave birth to our first son, Ransom, in early January of this year. And we had to manage me being in and out of the hospital with a newborn. And it was really tough. Um, There was some... God was really good. I mean, like... Again, I don't want to sound trite either and flippant, like the promises that we depended upon um, weren't the kinds that people sit you down and say, don't you know this verse? Like we knew those verses. The reality for us was God had continually, continually been present with us day after day, 
meeting us in prayer, meeting us through tangible expressions of other people. Um, and a lot of stuff was just like we could feel him and our soul and spirit weeping with us as we wept. We know it was really hard, but I was just reading. Um, I've been reading. I read a lot of the church fathers. And I was reading from Ambrose of Milan recently. And uh, one of the things that Ambrose talks about is that the devil seeks to test us uh, in order to ruin us. And God seeks to, quote, unquote, test us in order to crown us. And just that perspective has shaped how we have suffered and viewed as, as an opportunity to become a saint, to embody the love of Jesus for each other and for ourselves. And then know that this is like, this is what Paul does, right? Like so Paul talks about in the New Testament, um, run in such a way so you win the prize. And so mm-hmm. like whatever God Whatever we went through, God being present with us, we know is for a crown down the road. So yeah, literally a hell of a time. Man, I'm I'm so grateful for your progress thus far. Hopefully, uh once the uh the checkpoint of tomorrow is crossed that things will continue to go uphill and uh won't have any uh reversions there. Yeah, so we're hoping for no regress, only progress. So Josh, um, most people uh, who hit play on this episode will know you. And I mean, the same reason I reached out to you. I really love uh, your art online on your sword and pencil account. Um, Mm -hmm. Talk briefly. I I know you have talked uh, to a few other people. Again, thanks for your time. I know that you don't do a whole lot of um, stuff like this. I don't want to call it like press or media, but like really kind of putting yourself out there, engaging in long form conversations. So we... We really do appreciate that for you here, but um, talk to us briefly about like your relationship with art as, as ministry and uh, a building up of the saints. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Again, like it's an honor. I uh, don't do too many podcasts for no real reason other than I like the mystery and intrigue of not just being available online all the time. (laughs) And I'm sure that helps as an artist too. Yeah. Like I, yeah. You got to have a bit of the clout, the, the, what is that? Yeah. I don't just know. The intrigue or mystery. Yeah. It's just that mystery and intrigue. Um, yeah. So art for me has just been like a craft that I've honed and one that I am strangely drawn to, um, writing and drawing and designing are big ones for me. And I think, um, as I've curated because that's what calling is, right? Like cur- calling is something that we curate. And so the whole story leading up to how I started Sword and Pencil is one thing. But once I started deciding and seeing what I loved and what people responded with, like that overlap and what's needed for the world, those as they overlapped, uh, I just was able to keep honing in on things that I love doing and that people were responding with. And a deep deep value of mine, which I learned from Dostoevsky, is beauty will save the world. So Dostoevsky was Russian Orthodox Christian. He wrote some great books. That's a plug for down the road. Brothers Karamazov, Crime and Punishment, Notes from the Underground. I read a number of his shorter stuff in college, and I've got a couple of his books on my shelf. I just haven't uh, taken the plunge just yet. Yeah, they're. I mean, they're big ones. Like I'm looking at Brothers Karamazov on my bookshelf right there, and it's like seven, eight hundred pages, and it's like not easy yeah. reading. Yeah, it's good reading. K- but Karamazov not- and Crime and Punishment are on my shelf. I, I loved his short fiction, but it, that's something that I feel like, and I guess all art to degree, I- engaging well is a commitment. Yeah. But a a a novel like that is a, a level of commitment that I don't feel like I'm I'm able to do right now. Totally. And that makes sense because it's one, that's one of those books. Kurt Vonnegut said, everything you need to know about life is in that book. And that no, every author who's writing something since then is just trying to figure out how to retell Brothers K their own way. Nice. Um, and it's like a deep thing to have to work through. So um, Dostoevsky said, beauty will save the world. And that has been an apologetic and framework for my life. 
uh, for at least the past, uh, the past decade. I think beauty is one of those things that we need to frame our life in and around, not just from a what we produce perspective. So as an artist and as a writer, like, yeah, that's what I try to do. I try to confront people with the most beautiful stuff I possibly can. But I also think beauty is a thing that we need to participate in, like with what we do day to day, like our houses should be beautiful. Our marriages and relationships and friendships should be beautiful. We should take time to stop and smell the roses. We should eat good food and have good drink and read good books and watch good films, like all Amen. of these beautiful things. And so for me, Sword and Pencil is just an extension of that. Sword and Pencil is just me saying, hey, hey, here's some of the beauty that I've experienced in my life and I want to share with you guys. So that's kind of like the pulse of Sword and Pencil. One of the things I really appreciate about you and your work and your platform is the the focus on those transcendentals. Like Dostoevsky says, beauty will save the world. But that, that goodness, truth, and beauty – as a even more than apologetic, like as a a lifestyle. I, I know that some of uh, the folks in our community are really into apologetics. There was a period I was in. Not that I think there's anything wrong with it, but what most people think of when they think of apologetics is, as I go on my journey, I much mm-hmm. prefer the the transcendental, a uh, beauty, goodness, and truth. Right? Because talk about how goodness and beauty are are necessary companions to truth not that truth isn't important but how it's yeah. uh, not not a solo act yeah so in general there are at least three transcendentals goodness truth and beauty and those are like what we would say from a philosophical perspective those are the foundations of like the universe so like god is obviously the source the triumph god is the source of all things Um, But goodness, truth, and beauty are irreducible within him. So everything that exists is a reflection of God's goodness, truth, and or beauty. Now, those things aren't completely separate, right? They interpenetrate. That's crazy. I know I'm getting a bit philosophical, but it's worth it. So our conception of truth needs to have as part of it goodness and beauty. Our conception of beauty needs to have a part of it goodness and truth and how we act the goodness needs to be both beautiful and true and when we take one at the expense or ignorance of the others we end up in these extremes um and you can see them all over the place right you can well it's hard to avoid them right like we totally in i want to say especially now because i'm a man of the 21st century but you look throughout history and It's easy to go to extremes. When you find something good, it's easy to kind of get tunnel vision. Like it doesn't even have to be radical or malicious. You're just like, oh, this is good. Let me go all in on it. And it's easy to kind of lose sight of everything that's outside of that. Totally. Especially like we live in a very rationalistic, scientistic universe, materialistic. And so truth for us has become a kind of idol. And we only think of one kind of truth, like a rational, reasonable, scientifically measurable truth. And truth has become something that people can lord over one another, like take in the Christian works in the Christian space. Everything can just be reduced to truth and conversations about truth. And that's fine. That's truth is a good thing. Like I'm not anti-truth. I no, you've got a lot of uh, yeah. biblical, historical, creedal uh, stuff on your – like on all of – like if you swipe past the initial image, which is beautiful, is eye-catching, you're not just a uh, an illustrator. That's not what your feed yeah. is. But even – there are more slides to almost everything. Totally. And that's because the – idea of how I view what truth ought to be is informed by goodness and beauty. And so um, I am against a kind of like shallow, empty husk of truth that just turns into a weapon and it turns our church spaces into, and don't get me wrong if your church meets in a gym, but just like hollow, empty, barren wastelands that don't really reflect ultimate truth anyways. And so I, like you said, we go to these extremes and we have these value systems. And part of the thing that I like to do is to 
not upend it, but when I do like whatever kind of cultural exegesis analysis and look at what the world around me needs, um, I've looked at church history in the modern world and seen where the apologetics based on truth has gotten us, where apologetics based on goodness has gotten us. You have tons of stuff where it was like you had all the anti-Catholic rhetoric and the whatever debates against creation versus evolution. And I'm sure God has used those for his purposes and people have gotten saved from whatever does God exist debate kind of thing. Agreed. You, I, and I definitely yeah. like we, we've had a lot more of those conversations off air, but whenever we are critical here on the substance or on any of the social media, like it isn't to purely condemn or to mock or any of that. It is to yeah. more so to encourage a, hopefully a more holistic and, and full approach. Yeah. I think that we, I think you're bang on. Like we live in a world that is way too sensitive to quote unquote critique and you can't do life that way. Right. We live it like, if you want to become stronger, if we want our churches to become better, if we want our relationships to become better, we have to become stronger and to become stronger, you work on your weaknesses. And so if we admit that the church needs to become stronger, we have to admit that the church has weaknesses and that means we have to work on them. And so like, you don't need to hang your head in shame to say, Hey, like these are some issues with stuff we've seen. Those kinds of conversations are required and there are ways to do them really well. Like we live in a world where also people are just dunking on people and. Well, that's where some of the goodness comes in, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Like you can't, that's like the, your bank, like that interpenetration of those things is so vital because there are people who are just like heresy hunters and malign everything that isn't in their boy, camp. Oh boy. <laughs> yeah. Well, in my, in, in the little bit of research I was able to do, uh, I actually mm -hmm. pulled up my notes app from like June in, in my phone. Um, one of the, po it was either a podcast or an article you wrote. I don't remember the source, but mm -hmm. you mentioned that you uh, also, uh, similar to me, we have this in common, uh, uh, went to get our MDivs at a, a reformed seminary. So yes. I, I very much understand that, uh, that, uh, that camp. Totally. And there's a lot of things that I'm grateful for. Like, my upbringing, I feel like, while well, now I see a lot of the shortcomings of that approach, I just because there's shortcomings, I I don't like spurn it or throw it away or like have any yeah. ill will towards it. Like fundamental, like there's a lot of good things that came from fundamentalism. I would just like to encourage the the goodness, beauty, and truth to all be growing. Yeah, totally, and I mean. Yeah, I did go to a Reformed Baptist Seminary. I left early. I uh, I was one course away from getting my MDiv, but I just had enough, and I wasn't gonna wait the. Four it was silly. I was younger. I don't. I didn't need the MDiv. I got the same. <laughs> whatever. Yeah, I knew that I didn't want to be a full time pastor, but I wanted the training. Totally. I mean, I'm. I um, love the training. I mean, all it's my life now still, same for you. Like these are super important things to have learned. I don't bite the hand that fed me in one sense, but they were, they wouldn't like to hear this, but they were the guides that led me to a door out into a brave new world that uh, allowed me to see the world more holistically, to engage with philosophy and the church fathers and broader Christendom and develop a worldview that was so much bigger than a uh, protesting antagonistic whatever Protestant reform thing that I grew up in. And like I said, there's no, there's like not purposeful shade, but when you leave a place behind, you leave for a reason. And there are reasons. Absolutely. And I, I don't mind sharing those reasons if someone asks, uh, but I'd love my reformed brothers and sisters, like no harm wish to them. No, absolutely. And the way you put it, um, my former co-host, uh, Trevor, my lifelong friend, um, we have, I don't know. We we probably had that sentiment uh, on air previously, but yeah, we talk about that regularly. I just saw him here in Kansas City with his family. He's got a new little baby boy that's just under two months. Got to see him uh, last weekend, and yeah, it's just like we were given the tools to see God in many ways correctly and to see Scripture in many ways correctly, and that led us to 
expanding beyond some of the barriers that are also in those systems. Totally. And it's crazy. I was chatting with one of my buddies last night and uh, he sent me a YouTube video. There's this talk John Piper did, um, a guy I haven't mentioned or listened to in like 15 years. But they thought the, he was at this um, conver- like association for psychologists or counselors or something. And they had like a two part um, presentation going on. First was going to be John Piper and then was going to be a comedian. And when they had Interesting. to do it, they mentioned that John Piper was the comedian. And so he was <laughs> chatting about all this stuff. And it was really deep and really emotional and classic John Piper, a bit guilt, a bit vulnerable, a bit emotional. And everyone was just kind of laughing at him. And it was this really hard video to watch. But I was chatting with my buddy after saying, like, I remember some of those books, like Don't Waste Your Life. And maybe the idea or sentiment behind it came from a good place. But the way the reform world discussed lots of those things really was difficult on me and my walk of faith. And even reflecting on a little bit last night to say like, exactly, you're right. I learned tons of stuff um, that I will never forget or am very grateful for, but so tightly coupled with so much that was hard I'm not going to use the word abusive. I know some people have experienced abuse at some of those churches or whatever, so that's different. But just such a, um, a different framework, duality than where I am. It's yeah. uh, like you said, it's not bad. It's not a negative thing to have criticisms and especially totally. to have criticisms of either systems of belief or practice is not a criticism essentially of another human being who exercises within those systems. Totally. And like those are, all this stuff is super important as we learn to frame our lives, right? Like um, to go back to the transcendentals, if we believe that it's our goal to be after truth, God is the source of truth, then we have to have the humility to like kind of not divorce ourselves per, like completely from our belief because we are what we believe and we are what we do. We are what we love, but also to not take it so personally when we are wrong or when someone critiques us, because that's the kind of way that we sharpen and hone how we live our lives, right? It's not just, I'm going to go through this life every day swinging aces. (laughs) Oftentimes you make mistakes and it's from those mistakes that we learn the most. And that's why we have a community. People can... Um, again, critique isn't the right word, but you're married, I'm married. If my wife didn't tell me the times I was being selfish, yeah. I would never know. This isn't critique, that's love. It's love to be like, Josh, if you keep going this way, the things are going to get really bad. Yeah. And that's like fellowship of the saints isn't just helping each other with physical needs or getting each other jazzed up about spiritual growth. It's, it's these things as well. Like that's the, as iron okay. sharpens iron, like that's not always a, a, a comfy feeling initially, but that's uh that is good, virtuous, uh, necessary really, if we're going to be yeah. thriving work. It's a requirement. And, you know, as an artist, so as a, a man and an artist and a writer, I find myself in a, in a, maybe a kind of minority in like the artistic world, which tends to be more emotional, just different, right? Like when you take, when you picture sure. a stereotypical artist, I know I don't fit that mold, which is great. That's why I feel like I have a, um, a voice in, a, in an ecosystem. But one of the things that I've been like pondering in the, for the past couple of years is this idea of what we framed like art and love and community to be um, where art is no longer a weapon or tool to stand up against something um, or to reveal, like give you eyes to see something more clearly. And if it does do that, it's so superficial, it's propagandistic. And then love and community, we've elevated to not just an unconditional love as somebody comes in to a space and to a community into the quote unquote way of Jesus, but like this ongoing 
like lowest common denominator idea of unconditional love that would never read the rest of the Sermon on the Mount to someone because Jesus is just saying, I demand this from you. I demand this from you. I demand this from you. And so culturally, it's been very interesting to watch how these things unfold where, yes, there are some people who have been hurt by church. And then there's some people who are defending the church and I want to do, but I have, I have both of those things. Um, but I don't want to, in my defense of the church, be so, what's the right word for it? Have my ears plugged so much. Belligerent. Yes, that I can't hear. Mm -hmm. But then also, I don't want to be the kind of person that's on the other side that says, you know what? you don't get to demand anything from me. Like we are not used to what it means to be under authority, to have leadership, to have expectations and marry those things with this is what unconditional love actually is. No, absolutely. And it's almost like, I love it when I'm having these conversations that I don't have like a super tight outline, but there are a couple of things I wanted to mention in you you have set me up perfectly for the next thing that I was kind of thinking I wanted to talk about is just the um, the ability of the ability and um, characteristic of art to be mm -hmm. prophetic in a culture. We recently yeah. had um, Chicago film critic and longtime um, movie podcaster Josh Larson on talking about horror cool. movies because it's spooky season um, and talking about how in a lot of ways horror can prophetically look at the things that are harmful and that we fear in society through an entertaining mm -hmm. narrative structure that can kind of get at things that an essay or something like that wouldn't. So how, how do you in your, your visual art primarily um, engage, seek to strive towards engage with uh, that work of being prophetic? Yeah. Um, I think all art is about giving somebody eyes to see something you've seen. Yeah. So like all art is revelation and I can behold something. It can be as simple as like a waterfall. I see a waterfall and maybe one day I'm out on a hike with my wife and I see this waterfall and I'm strangely drawn to the mist as it rises up, as it falls and it's hitting, the sunlight is hitting it. And so it looks like these like sparks of fire flowing up from the water. And I'm just mesmerized by the beauty that I've seen in a waterfall. So when I go home and say, paint it, pretend I'm an, a master painter, I don't need to paint a photorealistic waterfall. I want to show you what I have seen. And so I will do whatever I possibly can to make sure that the mist you see looks like it was caught on fire from the sun. And so all art is like that. It's giving someone eyes to see what you have seen. And if it's there, someone from film or someone from dance or someone who writes or someone who does some sort of music, it's ears to hear, it's hands and feet to do. We want to participate. And so um, C.S. Lewis talks about, C.S. Lewis is a big influence on my life. He talks about as soon as we try to be prophetic or as soon as we try to speak to an age, become kitschy. We date ourselves, and I'm not going to throw shade at anyone, but you can see that kind of art all around us. Oh there is goodness. art that was, yeah, that's just made so superficial. It's like pablum, right? And some people like that. That's fine. Um, I don't think it's good for an artist to. I, be I think it is bad for the <laughs> culture, like, yeah, and especially bad when. It becomes popular and the norm. Like, man, yeah. I'm trying to stay healthy. You're in the gym way more than I am. But I mean, I think it is good and fine to have like ice cream and cake every now and then. But that's not like you don't eat three square meals of that a day and expect to get healthy. Totally. And so when uh, you're bang on, when we, when I begin to conceive of not only how, what am I receiving and what am I understanding and what do I want to express? Um, I recognize that for me, it's often like the deepest, most unutterable parts that will be the most prophetic. If I'm going for a walk, like I always take my notebook with me. If I get an idea, like a phrase, I'll write that down. If I have an idea for an image, 
I'll write that down. And then when I start producing my art, I just sit down and sketch and let things go where they will. Part of that means, you know, discipline is freedom. So there has to be a certain amount of skill to be able to express artistically what you want to or what pops into your mind freely. Well, I heard you even talk about workflow. Like it is easy to romanticize the creative act regardless of the medium. And it's like, oh, totally. like you do get inspiration when you go walking, but then you have to filter that through some sort of process totally. because your Instagram feed that has that is undeniably engaging and drawing and gets loads of engagement, like that doesn't just happen. Like you can have little epiphanies here and there, but there yeah. must be discipline in the pursuit of art. 100%. And so like one of the things I get messages all the time, like, oh, how can I do what you do? And I said, draw for the past 25, 30 years of your life and read theology for the pa and literature for the past 25, 30 years of your life. Get most of an MDiv. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> get really jaded, drink too much, smoke too much, <laughs> come back out the other side. Get married, and have you a beautiful too, yeah. child. Yeah, he's the best. Um, and so like, there is like this discipline that is required like as part of the artist. Hunter S. Thompson talks about how like the artist's life looks romantic, but it isn't for everyone. You have to, you live on like this knife edge of being able to experience everything that you go through and not want to fall off either side by going all the way in, right, to depression and sorrow and anxiety and fear. But you don't want to remove yourself so much that like all of your life is wine and roses and you just have nothing left to say. Um, and so as far as being prophetic, the uh, when I sit down and write the captions and when I sit down and write for anything, I am a kind of person that believes that the, the depth of work I have done previously and continue to do with what I read and what I consume, I sit down and try to do everything like, all in one go. So the captions, I sit down, nice. I say, I say a quick prayer and I say, let's do it, write it, post it. Um, because I think that's Is where it pretty much like a raw rough draft. Yeah. I'll go back and I'll be like, Hey, if I repeated Spelling a word whatever. too many times, then I'll like switch nice. out the word. Um, but there's something that's very human to, to that, right? Like, so I know, um, I know that when I write a caption, it is actually me. And I know that people, when they read it, they feel, I, at least I hope they feel, and it seems like they feel, that they're communicating with a person, not a persona, not a brand, not saying what I'm supposed to say. I'm saying what's actually going on. And so like prophetic, you can't force pro like prophecy. You can't, not all of my work is, what's the right way of saying this? Like all of my work means something to me, but not all of my work is as good as there are some pieces and some captions and some moments that are just so much better. That's fine. I know that. That's that goes the same for everyone. Yeah, you, not everything's a ten out of ten banger. Totally right. Like I, I'm not just shooting lightning bolts and just nailing absolutely everything. Or else you'd be that artist who maybe is like, well, I'm only going to put out something every like two or three years, and then that's totally. almost like. That that's not even mystique. That's almost like you kind of yeah. Uh, you're an isolationist. Yeah, and and that's the thing is part of what I do is post pretty often with stuff I'm proud of, but some of that is just like a raised revolutionary fist to the content machine that says like I want to show people that you know not everything needs to be perfect, but it can be good. Um, and so that's like, a really good reminder as somebody who both enjoys, but sometimes feel compelled to, uh, create various types of content. Right. Yeah. And so like the content machine says like, well, you need to make it look like it's just you, but you have an entire team of people behind you that make it look effortless and you put out viral content every single day and that's your way to succeed. And like poor artists who like just <laughs> yeah, want right. to draw or whatever, create in whatever capacity, and everything shifts and moves around them and people's um, 
people's ability to pay attention, people's what they're craving, what's trending, what's not, algorithms, whatever. We get formed by these things. And I think for me, I've just made the decision to do the stuff that I love. I post it no matter what, um, whether it does well or whether it doesn't, I really don't care because part of art is being in some capacity true to yourself, right? Like they're, one of my good buddies is like a pretty famous um, Christian musician. And we were chatting the other day about the frustration where you were like, before you could create and make art and make music and let it speak for itself. And now you get pushed from your agent, you get pushed from whatever marketing team to become like some social media manager. Um, everything's about going viral. And when you look, when I look around me, the thing that I despair about the most, honestly, when I look to the future, is an entire generation of people formed by social media that think everything in life is for other people to see. Everything is yeah. instant. Everything is about eyes and engagement, where most of it is unseen. Or even that a a infinite, constant stream of content is good or desirable. Or, or that is even like normal. Like it's not oh. always even plugged as good, but like this is this is okay and we should all be okay with this when it's like Totally. And as somebody who participates to a degree, like I, I don't make the podcast and we don't put out things just to get engagement. We do it because we feel compelled, mm -hmm. uh, we feel called in some ways, mm -hmm. people respond and we feel like we're, we're ministering to a need, but also like we, we love doing it. And yeah, I mean, yeah, obviously it would be cool for more people to see it and for us to be able to have <laughs> yeah. a life of an artist, yeah. but to be able to take care of my family, making things that I'm extremely passionate about, but man, like all in time in a, in a fallen world, like yeah. that, that's not always the way it goes. Sometimes those are hidden blessings, right? Like, uh, I think that this is me being a bit of a purist for artists. So my wife, like I'm my deepest creative outlet is writing, but my wife is like a true artist. So like if she doesn't paint, she dies. And so I do Incredible agree with work. Aisling yeah, she's amazing. An she's an incredible amazing. painter. Um, and so I totally believe that everyone is creative and everyone has something to express. And everything you just said, like clearly the podcast is doing well. You're great at it. This is engaging. It's fun. But there are this like there's this tier of people who if they could not do this, they would die or they would do this no matter what. And that's what you're embodying right now. Right. You're doing a job, but you are also doing this because you need to do this. And so I need to draw, I need to write. If I don't do those things, I don't know what would happen to me. Um, and so like I have like- Your this, joy would probably decrease significantly. Yeah, I wouldn't know how to communicate or interact with the world, right? I want to talk about stuff. I want to write about stuff. I want to visualize stuff. And so I have this very tight definition of an artist, which is like an artist is someone who needs to create and if they don't, they shrivel up and die. Not every person who makes crafts is an artist and not everyone, like I don't even refer to myself as an artist when I refer to my drawings. I refer to myself as an artist when I refer to my writings because that's like my craft that I need. Yeah, and so the as far, to circle back to the prophetic thing, just as far as like being prophetic, it's, it's a thing you can't force. And once you start forcing it, it becomes superficial. It becomes trite. It becomes kitschy. It's propaganda. It's not real. But everything you said, like when you start doing something like for your podcast, for my art, for my writing, when you feel like you're called to it, when you feel like you need to do it, like you have to say something, you have to do something, what that's tapping into it's not the selfish need to be seen or be heard or express. What that's tapping into is the stuff that gives you joy. And there's no telling, like I actually don't even have the criteria to measure this or even begin to conceptualize it, but there's no telling what you doing, what's joyful for you, how much good that will have on the world, not just your own soul, the souls of your wife, your kids, your family, your community, the world around you. 
doing what is good and true and beautiful that gives us joy is literally like many revolutions all over the world that just spread goodness. I think so many people, I'm going to go off for a second. I think so many people are living the most mundane, ugly, joyless lives, Christians included, and it makes everything about life seem cynical, ugly, disgusting, repulsive, and so we don't want any part of it. My vision is to say, I want to do as much as I can that gives me joy so that everything about my life makes people excited to live and participate in goodness. And that I know should just send shockwaves to everyone around me. And this point very humorously ties back to something you were talking about earlier. I have mature, say mature, almost sounds pejorative. I have grown personally uh, away from certain aspects of that. But really the impetus, one of the main catalysts for me when I was about 15 or so in this positive direction was reading Piper's Desiring God. Mm -hmm. um, I had, growing up in reform spaces, I don't think I had read or listened to anybody talk about joy as a virtue mm -hmm. um, in that way before him. And I'm, I'm eternally grateful for that. That was so affirming because yeah. I'm like, I know me. It is very important to me to, uh, per, just like everybody else, to pursue things that are filling. And I know that I can be sometimes uh, too much in that mm. uh, in that way, but like you said, it's. I, I feel like my soul would shrivel up and die if I did yeah. not engage critically, both as a uh, consumer is not the right word, but like a participant in mm -hmm. art. Because I don't. I don't really think we should be. I understand the frame of a consumer, but I really think like to be a participant in art, like mm -hmm. you are engaging with it, whether it's a film or a book or an album or what have you, like you are, somebody has put something out there, hopefully like with um, integrity and intent mm -hmm. and by engaging with that, like we are filled up. Like totally. obviously like there's the food, water, shelter, companionship thing. But I, I really do think that my, I, I know that particularly my soul without beauty, man, that would just be miserable. Yeah. And I think you nailed two things that are so important. One of them is like God is the source of goodness, truth, and beauty. And so all of the stuff that we're looking for that is good or true or beautiful, we're ultimately looking for him. He is the source. And all of these things are gateways back into the source. And so when we want to engage in beauty, it might be my art, it might be a film, it might be a poem, it might be a dance, it might be a piece of music, it might be something in nature, it might be a kiss from your beloved, whatever, it doesn't matter. These things are gateways back to the substance. These are shadows. God is the substance. And I think that's so key because as we participate, that's the other key that what you said, as we participate in goodness, truth, and beauty, we are participating in the divine life, right? And so, again, there's no telling what kind of good that will do for us as we participate and engage with art, as we participate in goodness, because that is part of God's transforming work for our souls. We either go further up and into God's goodness, truth, and beauty or we reject it and push it away and leave his goodness, truth, and beauty. One of the things you talked about, I think it is important, but I would love to hear your perspective, both for myself and listeners, as one of the tenets of the, the show, the podcast, all the different feeds is uh, ho hopefully a positive type of, uh, usually it's a film and some books, but the idea of criticism, again, in an engaged way, like, there is good art, and in some ways there is bad art, but I would love to hear your uh, thoughts because I feel like, again, it was either in an article or in a previous podcast you talked about how comparison in art, and probably as an artist yourself, that it is like unavoidable, but also there's, there's a lot of traps in, in comparing like art with art. Yeah, comparison is like 
it's cliche to say, but it's the thief of joy. Um, when I see good art, I want to have the kind of mind and heart that allows me to be encouraged by it and desire to do more and be better, right? I see these artists online and some are amazing. They're like way better than I will ever hope to be. But that just propels me forward in my own craft. And there's something about being able to have the humility to participate in another person's art that allows you to be inspired and to create more and to stand on the shoulders of giants or take the same concept and imagine it a different way, picture it a different way. And so art is one of those things that like um, we all hit creative blocks. We all get bored. We all feel stuck. We all get to spots in life where we don't know what to do next. And for me, the way out of those dead spaces is to have like a refresh of beauty, right? I, I'm a big proponent of being bored. I think that distracting ourselves with doom scrolling on social media or like, I love me a podcast, but just like the constant input, we don't let ourselves be bored enough to start making connections. We don't sit and listen. We don't sit in quiet. Pascal once said, I think it was Pascal, he once said that all of humanity's problems can be chalked up to the idea that no one wants to sit alone in a room quiet for an hour. Hmm. And if you made someone, in, he wrote this ages ago, if you wrote, if you made someone formed on TikTok videos and Instagram reels and YouTube shorts, try to sit in a room by themselves, disconnected for an hour, they would implode. They would cease to exist. And so that's a big thing for me, but also like good food, good drink, good sex, good conversation, participating in good art. These things revive us and bring us back to see beauty more fresh and then want to participate in it more and express it more. And so for me, like I have on my desk right now, I've got the complete works of Chaucer. I've got um, a book called Kenegea by David Bentley Hart, which is a Gnostic tale. I'm reading a bunch of stuff by George Orwell. I like, I have to just be constantly engaging with things that I find interesting and beautiful or else I just like, like we said, I begin to disappear. I begin to uh, look at life assuming that I know best and that I can understand it with just my own two eyes rather than having the eyes and minds and hearts of all these experts around me to not only humble me, but also let me see things I'll never be able to see on my own. Well, and that is perfect. See, this is this is primo, Josh. We should, if you weren't so far away, I'd say we should hang out. If I'm ever in Canada, <laughs> yeah. I'll, uh, I'll hit you up. Um, one of the things I know we're getting uh, towards the end here. I'd love to hear about just commend to. Uh, so a lot of our audience probably grew up similarly to you and I, because that's how. Mm-hmm a lot of people find you who are, who are similar, Mm -hmm. what would be your encouragement to maybe the folks who are curious and haven't jumped yet? What would be your pitch to, to read widely in, in church history from across the world and across time? Like I grew up also with a very anti-Catholic, anti-liturgy bias and just be, I am just beginning um, we've covered a number of the books from IVP. They're doing the the fullness of time, like church calendar. Like they're doing little thin, like 100 page, very beautifully put together volumes about like Lent and Pentecost and Advent, all these things that people who really a lot of people in our age range and who grew up the way we did, who are going, I would like to engage with the 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 wide totality of the the family of God throughout time and geography. Yeah, uh, the pitch would be this: is just like you can't be strong if you live in an echo chamber. There's just no ability. You, C.S. Lewis, I'm going to quote him nonstop. He talks about these people who sit around in a circle and they chat and they abolish they demolish all these arguments but they're all straw men and they're all patting each other on the back saying aren't we so smart we've defeated everyone no one is strong enough to talk to us and he's like if you want to be strong you read widely like i learned this my undergrads in physics and so you just learn very quickly that if you want to find the truth 
you have to go up against everything that is not true, that confronts you, things that you ha- you have a problem and you have to find the solution. And there's tons of ways not to do it. Um, and so the Oscar Wilde talks about how some people, uh, there's someone he was writing to who didn't learn what he called the Oxford manner, which is the idea to play with ideas gracefully. And that's like my MO, right? I want to play with ideas gracefully. I want to continue to learn, to interact. Some I'm going to agree with, some I'm not. I want to know why I agree with. I want to know why I disagree with them. So the pitch is, if you want to be strong, if you want to be after the truth, you just read. You just interact widely. And I'll be honest with you, that doesn't just go for reading the church fathers Reading across time. That goes- <laughs> no, not all. You're talking about people who disagree with us. That's all still like, I know we sometimes have these small conceptions, want to be gracious. That's still the family of God. <laughs> yeah, totally. And that's the thing is like, like, we're still the same team, even if we have differences. We should yeah. be. We see through a glass dimly, and one day we will behold more clearly. And so the biggest thing that I see is the kind of arrogance it takes to think that I'm 35 years old, that I, a 35-year-old man who has read a lot, but like just the the a p- like peak arrogance to assume, yeah, 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 yeah I've got this. <laughs> there are thousands of years of church history. They didn't figure it out. Don't worry. Your boy Josh did. And I'll draw you a picture about it. Like that's just yeah. peak arrogance. Right. So like it takes humility to read across. And like when you read across doctrinal lines and domains, you have to also have the ability to interact with intention and integrity. We when we engage, it's very easy to reduce everyone else's argument into the most simplistic, derivative thing that obviously nobody disagrees with. But that's what got me out of that world. Right. So when I was in seminary, I started reading across doctrinal domains, not just within Protestantism, but in Eastern Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism. People asked me, like, what, what's your silver bullet for defeating Calvinism or whatever? And I was like, there isn't one. You, uh, you construct a worldview that you believe to be more consistent based on better assumptions than this Reformed Baptist one. And so... Not only that, like, I think that we need to do that, like, for church history, but I think we need to do that for literature. I've learned more from literature, maybe not more. I've learned so much from literature, it's unbelievable. So, like, I grew up Reformed Baptist. Um, We talked about sin and total depravity and whatever else all the time, but I did not understand sin or rebellion until I read A Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde. I didn't realize that I can look perfect on the outside and commit all these atrocities, and this hidden inner person is slowly being destroyed. And I didn't realize until I read that book that those choices I made had insane negative effects on everyone around me, and that it will always find you. Sin will always catch you. Your rebellion will it will always come back to bite you. And can I cuss? You go for it. Yeah. It, sin will always come back to bite you in the ass. Like these are things that we learn from literature because artists different than say like a systematic theology that's going to talk about like sin is a privation or sin is that are going to tell us a story that resonates with our hearts and souls. And we say, Hey, you know what? I don't want to become a monster. So maybe I should stop at the rebellion thing and maybe I'll become a saint. It's brilliant. So like you have to read across not just like doctrinal domains, but like change your genre, read the read literature. That's a beautiful reminder too, because anybody who knows any sort of like literary or art history, Oscar Wilde, not famously a virtuous man, (laughs) um, (laughs) prone to many forms of excess and kind of self-destruction, but that's where truth and beauty together all of that comes from God. So when somebody mm-hmm. is executing highly and making something beautiful and well, like it doesn't have to be a sermon or a systematic totally. theology to have deep truth. And that's why, I mean, I'm 
I, I love all art, but but film and cinema, I feel like that for me mm-hmm. is one of the peaks because it it involves words, it involves images, it involves music, it involves light. Like all these things for me, it just perfectly speaks. I love to cinema. Me. But um yeah, whether it's it's the written word, whether it's uh, the, the word in song, in telling mm-hmm. stories, like these all have power to form us yeah. um, in a Godward way because a Godward way isn't just a – like spirituality isn't like an aspect of one's life. Like we are spiritual beings mm-hmm. and, it's and all of these life. things are connected. Yeah, like all truth is God's truth. All goodness is God's goodness. All beauty is God's good is God's beauty. And so as people who follow Jesus or not, as they proclaim a truth or just act in good ways or create something beautiful, they are unbeknownst to them, oftentimes participating in the divine life and expressing the divine life. There are tons of people I read like Oscar Wilde's one of them. I mean, like he was baptized as a Catholic and there are some ideas about him at the end of his life, but Throughout when he wrote some of his books, there's so much truth deeply embedded in them during a time that was clearly not like in pursuit of a virtuous, chaste, moral life. Um, And like, again, those are things that are so important to read because, again, it just gives us eyes to see. It expands our horizons, not just like rationally, but at this at, at a soul level, like at an emotive, impulsive, embodied level. Beautiful. Well, before that, that is a, a perfect note for this part of the conversation. Mm-hmm. But bef- before we do shout outs, there's one last question I have. We've been talking a lot about uh, a good life, a virtuous life, pursuing, um, acting and living and thinking rightly among other people. I, I was told you have uh, a very good story about one of the better things in your life happening to you as a result of you uh, uh, treating somebody maybe not uh, <laughs> as as well as you should. I heard there's a story about you uh, throwing mud at somebody. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how I met my wife. I, uh, <laughs> I was a rebellious little child and um, – in Canada, I don't know if you guys, it's kind of like Kingdom Bound. I think you guys have Kingdom Bound in the US. Like you go to a, like a, an amusement park and all these Christian bands show up and that they name, play. I, I was in Florida. This we is did old like school. Night of Joy. They had a couple of, <laughs> when you said Kingdom Bound, I was like, I don't know what it is, but I know what that is. Like, exactly. Like anyone who grew up in the church knows what it is. So my youth group went and separately her youth group went and they were doing the Christian concert thing. I was uh, shining a laser pointer in the band's eyes because, like I said, <laughs> I was a very mischievous little boy. And um, I got bored of that. It was rainy, and there were these people who were like Christian mosh pit on like this grassy hill by the concert. And they were like moshing, they were singing, and I was like, oh, man, those people are so lame. I'm going to go start a mud fight. So I walked over. I picked up some mud and thought to myself, I'm going to throw this at the prettiest girl I see, do a circle. There's Aislin, throw some mud at her. One thing led to another. We're married happily for eight years and we have a child. So I love that. Sometimes, story. <laughs> yeah, sometimes being like a rascally little rogue of a boy ends up and you get to live the life of your dreams. All things for good, right? All things work out for good. And Ransom, that's a, a space trilogy reference, yep. right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So we, um, there's a few things that went into that name. Like, yes, Ransom from the space trilogy, which is a huge plug if you've never read that. I love that. I, I feel snarky when I bring it up because obviously everybody knows Narnia or The Great Divorce or Mere Christianity. But I'm like, I kind of feel like the space trilogy is pretty slept on. Oh man, it so is. And like, here's the thing. I don't think you get to call yourself a fan of Lewis if you haven't read it. Like that hideous strength alone. I mean, you have to go through the first two books to get to that hideous strength, but that hideous strength is unreal. I need it's an unreal book. Yeah, I know. I feel like I need to as well. Um, but also like bound up in ransom is not just like all the Christian ideas of laying your life down for others. Um, but it has like a kind of outlaw sound to it and 
speaking prophetic, we felt like our boy was going to be a lot like um, kind of like the noble outlaw that you see in Robin Hood, where the world and culture, wherever he is, is going to say one thing, but he's going to be out, quote unquote, outside the lines, but for the sake of the good. And when you look at these noble outlaws, all like as an archetype through all of art, they're all very charming. They're all very winsome. They're all very like brave and profound. And uh, that's just what went into his name. We wanted something. His middle name is Isaac, which is he laughs, God laughs. So the whole thing was Space Trilogy and the Noble Outlaw, etc. Yeah, that was uh, that was really fun naming him because we can slowly start to see some of those things unfold, which is beautiful. I love it. Yeah, anytime uh, you or Ace Lynn shares a picture or video, I'm like, man, it's so fun to watch a kid grow up from that age. Right? They're just unreal. I like, I've always loved kids. And now that I have my own, when I see other people's kids, I lose my mind. Like, kids are just right. so beautiful. Life is just so amazing to see unfold. And obviously, like, I'm very partial, but that kid is so dang cute. It, it Like, I see some, everybody thinks their kid is cute. And I think that that is good and right. But. <laughs> I don't know if I want to say this, but much like art, there is there is undeniable uh, yeah. excellence. <laughs> yeah. Some kids are most definitely – here's a way of saying it. They fit a mold of being that is more pleasing to our eyes. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah, Dave. Yeah. Cut that, some of that if you want. You have a beautiful yeah. son. I, yeah, thank I, I you love... very much. I love seeing my boys grow up and uh, yeah, yeah, it's so much fun. It's honestly um, unreal. So shout outs. You're, you're a well-rounded guy. You've already mentioned some. We might put some of those in the show notes. Um, if there's anything in particular, we can talk offline like resources that you really want to have. But since you're so well-rounded, I'd love if you gave us – we usually do a few. Mm-hmm. Give me maybe like one or two like books, films, albums that you would commend to people for their – their goodness, truth, and beauty. I'll start with albums. Um, you got to go Pink Floyd, The Wall. I think that's like a perfect album or Wish You Were Here, one or the other. And then uh, any early Bob Dylan. I love Bob Dylan, as much Bob Dylan as I can get. Those albums for me are quote unquote transcendent. They're amazing. I think they're absolutely spectacular. As far as books of, are concerned, Two books every person should read. Um, I'm always going to say East of Eden. I think East of Eden is a masterpiece. Um, and then I'll say something I don't normally say, but uh, get your hands on some poetry. It doesn't need to be like the world's greatest poetry. You can get an anthology and cruise through. But if you want to grab something that I would suggest, you can grab Walt uh, Whitman's Song to Myself. Or just like a, a handbook of Keats. I love Keats. That would be some really good reading. Films are tougher because I watch films for like various reasons, right? So there are sure. some that stir me up in some ways, but there are some films that, oof, films is tricky. Like my mind's bouncing across so many. I mean, you got to watch The Godfather just so you can say I've watched The Godfather part one and two. I'm hoping to introduce my wife to those soon. Yeah. Oh, that's a good idea, actually. I should do the same. You know what? Like, there's not, I love obviously some of the quote unquote, like, cliche masculine ones. Like, I love Gladiator and Braveheart and stuff, but those aren't ones that have, like, formed me super deeply. I love Lord of the Rings, but I would prefer it as a, I would suggest it as a book more than a film. Film is tricky, man. So, fr- from the heart. So, we got the Godfather saga. What's yeah, I love – yeah, Godfather 1 and 2, maybe 3. From the heart, what speaks to me the most from a film perspective? You know what? I'm going to go something not deep. I love Indiana Jones and Raiders of the Lost Ark. Bam. And I love also Last Crusade. I just love me a good adv- action adventure. Well, Josh, thank you for your time. Yeah. Um, obviously, Sword and Pencil is huge. Uh, nearly everybody who we engage with follows it, but where uh, where do you want to send people? Oh, hey, plug your book. You're working for Harper Collins. Yeah. Yep, uh, writing a book. Um, title can't be shared, um, but contractually, I am writing, yeah. 
I am writing a book and uh, that's going really well. And so all that is just wheels in motion, which is great. It's been a lot of fun. Um, if people want to follow me other places, like I have a sub stack called everyday saints that I sometimes write a little essay for, um, they can subscribe on my Instagram to like the saints thing and go deeper on film, photography, fashion, conspiracy theory, politics, essays, you should read it. Just literally like the well, and whole you're very of engaged. Life. I'll give a plug so that you don't even have to do it. I yeah. love that you are very, you are deeply engaged. Like you can tell, you don't want to say that you're omniscient or whatever. But like it seems to be clear <laughs> that some people are motivated primarily by building an audience versus providing value or engaging in, in a good way. And I, I really do love to see the way that you solicit feedback and engage really uh, intimately with that feedback. So one oh, of thanks, the man. exemplary accounts, I feel like if somebody wanted to start something, I feel like <laughs> look at that blueprint. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, you only get one shot at life and living it to the fullest. And then like, there's no secrets here. I want everyone to do well. And um, I'm no guru, right? I'm not everyone's sage. I'm not going to be the person that leads you to the other side, just another guy on the same path as everyone else. And so I don't think of myself more highly than I ought. And uh, yeah, I just think mm, so many people online are like brands and personas. They're curated by their marketing team because they have to sell a certain amount of stuff. And I don't, and I, even if I did, I wouldn't care. Um, and I think that that's what most of us are longing for is real people. And we're just being sold all these like marionettes who are performing for us and we're buying their books. I don't want to get upset. I don't want to, <laughs> again, start a conversation that we don't need to, but I do really appreciate it. And that is a value of mine to be deeply engaged and, as accessible as I possibly can. I mean, it's really difficult. There's a lot of people now. Um, and I do try yeah, my you best. Yeah, you got like a hundred and plus thousand folks. <laughs> yeah, there's something Interacting like with that. Interacting with your polls. There's, that's quite a bit. Yeah, so I can't interact with everything, but I do try my best and uh, really do genuinely take time because it's a blessing for me, right? Like, I don't take this lightly. Um, and so to whom much has been given, much is required. So I... Uh, yeah, I'm very humbled by it, very honored to do it, and it is just an absolute pleasure to do stuff like this, to do whatever I possibly can. Well, I appreciate it. If you're looking for um, a feed that will um, delight in, in truth and goodness and beauty and will challenge you, if you're looking to um, engage with different points of view, Josh has folks of all sorts who follow him with all sorts of uh, – engagement. So uh, I, I have been, I feel like more well-rounded in addition to the fantastic art uh, that comes on a, a very regular basis. Awesome. Dude, I'm glad to hear that. Thank you. Well, Josh, thank you, man. I hope, uh, hope to talk to you soon. Yeah. Honestly, this was amazing. Thanks so much. there you have it what a wonderful time with josh i just had i i really love meeting people i, I have enjoyed genuinely nearly 100 percent of the guests we've had on the show i personally really enjoyed it but josh is one of those guys where um if if we lived closer together i, I think we'd be uh hanging out pretty regularly so i don't know if we set it on mic at this point i i'm recording this outro uh, a day or two later but um, I talked with Josh after our recording. He's very interested, even though he doesn't do a whole lot of uh, public forum like this. He's very interested in coming back and doing a substantive cinema with us. So um, as you guys comment on the show or share the show yourself, let us know uh, maybe some ideas for movies you'd love to hear Josh come back uh, for on the future. 
Uh, links for Josh's sword and pencil account will be in the show notes. I'm sure uh, uh, many of you are following him already. Uh, guy's got over 100,000 followers, which both seems like a blessing and a curse based on our uh, discussion today. But I really appreciate how he is stewarding his role there. Um, check him out. Give him a follow. Uh, and if you really love what he does, give him an Instagram subscribe. He does do a lot of catered content for the folks who subscribe. Um, check out a sub stack and be on the lookout for that book from Harper Collins. I'm very excited about it. Um, and I will be sharing with you guys, um, what I'm allowed to share when I can. I know that book contracts, uh, uh, um, sometimes ha- have a special rollout. So as soon as I'm allowed to share stuff um, about his book, I will be sharing that with you. If you enjoyed this uh, conversation with Josh and you like to help more things like that happen, help us keep the lights on over at The Substance, you can uh, join us on Patreon for as little as $3 a month, um, have access to exclusive content and be able to vote semi-regularly for some of the books and films that we cover on the show. I know editor Dave with his Substack conversations he has. You also get early access to those. We've got Andrew Whitehead and his book on Christian nationalism already on there. You can hear editor Dave talk with Andrew Whitehead. Um, I have already recorded one for a future episode. So we've got some exclusive content coming. And then soon, and soon I will be jumping back on with Stephanie Stalvi for The Curse of the Cat People, which will also be a supporter only episode. So we're, we're starting to, as much as we're able, um, make that worth your while to support us as well as the, the great show we put out every other week and the library stuff we have. If you're newer to the show, we got a hundred plus episodes with some really great people. So if this is a value to you support, or if monthly support is not really your thing, um, if that's not in your budget or it's really not something you want to do, you can hit us at cash app dollar sign, the substance pod, it's worth a couple bucks, five, 10, whatever. Uh, you can hit us there at dollar sign, the substance pod on cash app. Um, we want to hear from you. Like we said at the top, this episode partially uh, became a reality due to a listener saying, Hey, I really love the work that Josh is doing at sword and pencil and you should talk to him. So um, hit us up on Instagram or email us at the substance pod at gmail.com. If there's somebody you would like us to reach out to and you think they would be a, a good fit um, for the show, please let us know. We would love to have them. Finally, uh, if you like the show, share it with a friend. And if you haven't consider leaving a one or two sentence review on Apple podcasts or hitting that five star button on Spotify, it just helps more people find the show. So so that's it for this week. Uh, I'm, I've been your host, Philip Marinello, and we are excited to see you back here in two weeks on The Substance. Final thoughts on Raiders, and then we'll close it out here before it does that again. <laughs> oh, yeah. Raiders is just like you were saying, a perfect movie. Man, I can't wait to see my son. Like, I'm excited to show him Star Wars. I'm excited to show him a lot of things that have unfortunately been so pervasive in pop culture they're probably like not surprising like i heard him the other day do the empire strike like i heard him start to do the empire strikes back speech i was like what are you what are you talking about hasn't done and then i realized he was doing it from toy story 2 with like buzz and zerg where there i was like man like that kind of stinks a little bit i love the toy story movies and i love that he loves them but i feel like it might still land if i show it to him at the right time. But if I wait too long, I feel like that's gone. But I feel like the face melting at the end of radars is just such a, a strong image. I can't wait to see it. I hope oh, it's not yeah. too scarring. I can't wait to see his reaction. Well, like, I mean, I saw Raiders way before I should have, and yeah. I ended up all right, but I think you're right. Like, I think that our, you know, some of these IPs have been, and you can get my take on all of this, like it's been <laughs> super cheapened my by goodness. the past five, 10 years. And so like, I have all my friends asking me about the Star Wars shows. I was like, I tried the first one and I didn't like it. Yeah. And now they've had 10 more since. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to watch like hours and hours and hours of this. Like can't in, if you like it, you like it. Like yeah. everybody like junk food is fun sometimes, but I don't feel like it's very filling. I'm the exact same, man. If you like it, you're wrong. I don't but like, I just, <laughs> you know, like you can like you can whatever you can enjoy what you want to enjoy but i uh in my mind like empire i'm not a, the biggest star wars fan but i think empire is 
an amazing movie. Um, and like I said, the Indiana Jones, especially Raiders and Last Crusade, mm. are amazing. Temple of Doom's okay, but compared also to also one new that I'll probably Indiana, wait a little. I'll probably definitely show him Raiders and Last Crusade before I show him Temple of Doom. That's oh yeah, Temple of Doom, man, be, like going into brutal. the heart. <laughs> Pretty brutal stuff. That was wild. I remember <laughs> seeing. I do remember seeing that as a kid, being like, "What?" Super gnarly. That was so wild. Well, Josh, man, thank you for your time. Uh, I, for sure. I I love following your feed. I love reading your captions. I love seeing your art. Uh, if I can find the right uh, artist here locally, I was looking at having maybe some of your uh, uh, First Corinthians fourteen uh, pieces maybe tattooed one day here. Oh, that'd be awesome! Yeah, feel free. So, um, yeah, love having you on. Maybe one of these days, since you're a movie guy, have you back for a uh, substantive cinema episode? I love having people who love movies kind of go deep on one. Oh, that'd be sweet. It's quite like living in a hyper-capitalist world does make a lot of things challenging. Boom. Takeover. Hostile takeover. Beauty will save the world. And cut. Whew. We got it. Man, it only took got us four there, different sessions for one stinking... Yeah, Dave's going to have a <laughs> one heck of a time. <laughs>